Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Ignorant Intellectual on Media. Today, I thought we'd do another mixed haul. I went out over the last week or two, and I found a lot of stuff. So um, it's going to take a while to get through it. So uh, buckle up. It's going to uh, be uh, we got CDs, we got books, we got uh, Blu-rays, got a huge documentary um, group of uh, movies. Um, it's just ridiculous. Anyways, let's get through stuff as quickly as possible, but still with uh, information. All right, so that's right. so first up is uh, Burmese Days by George Orwell. All right, Flory, a timber merchant, has educated himself to a point of self-disgust and acute horror of the English people in the small town of Upper Burma. Okay, so Burma was uh, an English colony at one time, and Orwell was stationed there, I think, during the war, and he ended up writing this book, which is a you know a critique of of, of the place and and how uh, embarrassed he is of, of English people. Anyways, um, anyways, it's a typical Orwell, 1984. You know, uh, Animal Farm, all those books that everybody loves so much. So it's, I picked this one up because uh, it's easy to sell. All right, we got the Bront, uh, Charlotte Bronte Jane Eyre. All right, I've already spoken about this. Uh, book before it's part of the uh, this this copy is part of the uh, Penguins Classics, which is extremely popular. Here's another one here. All right, um, this one is the not the latest uh, book cover edition of of it, but the one just before it. This one would be the latest version, right? So um, so these are the ones that if you go into a chapters or or an indigo or whatever, you'll see these ones on the shelf. Um, these ones are, were the ones that are, were before it, right? All right. So this is Bronte's Jane Eyre, one of the great 19th century novels by a by a woman. All right. Next up is D. H. Lawrence, Lady's Chatter, Lady Chatterley's Lover. This was a uh, one of Lawrence's greatest books. It's all about an independent type of woman who's in a in a marriage um, that is non-sexual, um, and she ends up taking in a lover with uh, the permission of her husband. And it goes on from there. It was quite a bit of a scandal going on when this first came out um, at the time. All right. So next up is one of the greatest American plays of all time. It's a car named Desire made into a film. Um, basically about, uh, what's her name? Uh, she's from the South. She ends up um, going to New Orleans to live with her younger sister because she's destitute. What was her name? Stella was her sister's name. What was her name? I can't believe I can't remember her name. Anyways. Um, and then her husband, the Stella's husband, they all live together and then uh, all hell breaks loose. Now let's put it that way. It's quite a fun and, uh, you know, deep play. And it's probably uh, William's best play, one of the greats in American literature. Next up is uh, an Oxford World Classic of. Machiavelli. All right. So this one, like the penguin that I showed you before, this is the previous version. It's not the latest. This is what the one before the latest looked like for the Oxford World Classics. They look like this now. There's an example. All right. They're really nice. All right. So these ones are the previous version of it. And uh, the prince, everybody knows the prince. Do you know the prince? It's required reading if you're going to read about a political philosophy. Basically, he's a uh, it's a letter or a uh, a book to a prince on how to rule, and given different versions of how a prince ends up coming into power or a king or whatever, um, depends on how they how they rule. It gets pretty brutal. That's why you get that expression. Uh, that's a very Machiavellian idea, as in sinister or you know deplorable evil or whatever, because you know Machiavelli speaks in, in the prince about that if let's say you're you're a your usurper king. Not only do you have to kill the king in order to take over his power, but you got to kill all of his family, his children, his uh, uncles, his his aunts, his you know his nephews, everybody in his family, so that they don't come back later to kill you and take power back, right? So, so it's pretty brutal, but um, it's one of the big um, political philosophy books that you need to read, you know, along with what like Leviathan. Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, you know, uh, John Locke's second treatise on government, and, you know, um, you know, the French philosophers as well. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, his uh, 
social contract, all that, those books are really interesting if you like political philosophy. And this one as well. So Aristotle's Politics, I just show you. This is one of the earliest. This one along with Plato's Republic are the two books from Greek, uh, ancient Greek uh, literature and philosophy that you would need to read if you like political philosophy. Aristotle was a student of this type of stuff in that he knew the ins and outs of all the different city-states in Greece, um, and he goes through them all in that and, and tells you what he thinks is good and better and, and how, how to run the state properly, right? So uh, next up is another American play as one of the greats, and that's The Crucible by uh, um, Arthur Miller. Now, Death of a Salesman is probably his greatest uh, book, but this one is really good as well. Um, I haven't read it though, so 1953 it came out. Uh, I won't go into it. We're doing this quickly, all right? So, um, but it's one of the greats. Then we have Anne Frank's Diary of a Young Girl. Basically, everybody knows this book. It's one of the the most best-selling books about the Holocaust, about her and her family and another family uh, in an annex in behind a person uh, in Amsterdam, uh, living in hiding from from the Nazis when the Nazis come into uh, Holland, um, but uh, so she, uh, you know, account, uh, makes an account of it in a diary. And uh, the depressing thing about this, I've speak, spoken about it before. I'll mention it one more time: is that when you read it, you know, you're following her, you know, her uh, emotional turmoil and her like of a boy, which is in the other family, and how they have to be quiet at certain times of the day, and how you know, you know, they're not fed the most and, and all anyways it goes through all those trials and tribulations of but you you get pulled into the story and you realize what's going on at the time and then the diary finishes without her finishing it it's not like she says goodbye at the end of the diary it's not like that it just the diary stops you know just stops right and then you know the reason why it stops is because you know the you know the nazis uh found them and off to the concentration camps with them they went and she did not survive the only reason why we have this book is because i think the father of um the other family uh survived the uh the holocaust and ended up having a transcript of that had that diary with him so that's the reason why we have it today all right so next up is the hobbit tolkien's greatest novel a lot of people will say it's the trilogy of Lord of the Rings, but I prefer The Hobbit. It's a much more interesting story with a little bit less characters. There's so many characters in Lord of the Rings, it's hard to follow sometimes. But in this one, it's you have Bilbo Baggins, and you have the uh, uh, you have the dwarfs, and you have Gandalf the wizard. And they go off to a mountain to go get back the dwarfs' uh, gold that a uh, that a dragon named Smog took away from them, right? And it's his adventure uh, from the Shire to the mountain. All right, it's quite a fun read, if you like um, fantasy books. It's up there. I like Stephen R. Donaldson's stuff. I like uh, his stuff and some others. Um, uh, but I think The Hobbit would probably be my favorite of all time. Uh, or The First Chronicles of Thomas Covenant, Unbeliever. Well, it'd be up for grabs which one's I think they're the greatest fantasy novels of all time. All right. Next up is uh, the Quran translated. All right. So the Quran, um, Muhammad was illiterate. If my history understands, what he did was he basically, over a few years, basically um, dictated the Quran um, to, I think it was his brother who was literate. And they wrote it down, and that's how we ended up getting the Quran. Like what, 500 A.D. that it was that it was produced. Anyways, um, but it was written in Arabic, right? So uh, Muslims always tell you, all right, in Islam, that you should learn Arabic in order for you to read the Quran properly, rather than through translation. But how many people on the planet uh, can read Arabic, especially in the Western world, right? And uh, how many, you know, have the dis discipline or the um, acumen to learn Arabic? Right, it's not an easy language to learn. Right, so, um, so most most people will just get a translation. That's that's one of the translations that you can find. 
of, of the Quran. At least you get an idea. You don't get the exact words, but you get an idea. And, and you know, translations always lose something in translation. But at least you get an idea of what you know uh, Muslims read and what their uh, you know, holy book is and that kind of thing, right? So, all right. So that's an English translation of the Quran. Next up is Gabriel Garcia Marquez, clandestine in Chile. This was quite a uh, a good read if you have not read it. Um, I don't know if you call it a fiction or a nonfiction. It's kind of blurry there because uh, Garcia, there's a there's a director in Chile. Now this is after um, Pinochet takes over. You know the Americans go into Chile. There was, there was a you know a democratic election, and the Americans just didn't like who ended up becoming elected. As he was probably anti-American, so they went in and, and did a coup put in a dictator, which was Pinochet, and then for the next however many years, 50 years or whatever, he ends up uh, having this brutal dictatorship. People disappear. People end up dead. People end up in prison, um, all for him to sustain his power, the backing of the United States, right? So anyways, there's this film, uh, this director, film director, who, uh, what was his name? Miguel Litton, if I pronounce his last name right. All right. So, anyways, he fled Chile because um, of the Pin Pinochet uh, regime, and he ended up um, coming back clandestinely, uh, pretending to be a, another person. And he ended up uh, making some films that were anti an anti Pinochet. Um, and what happens is he ends up telling his story to Gabriel Garcia Marquez and Marquez ends up writing a book on it and that's this book here all right um so it's quite quite interesting if you have not read that all right next up is the i always brutalize the the pronunciation again this is an oxford world classic the ones before the new ones right um and this is the anid anid all right uh ignorant intellectual right but basically this is one of the oldest poems in latin and it basically tells about um uh, what's his name? Anais. Anais, who ends up surviving or escaping the Trojan War and ends up um, traveling from uh, Troy to Italy and how he ends up starting the Roman Empire or lays the foundation for the Roman Empire. That's uh, one of the greatest uh, Latin poems and one of the greatest Italian slash you know, Greek literature. Well, of all time, everyone who takes ancient literature ends up taking this book, right? All right. Next up after that is The Little Prince. This is one of the greatest um, children's stories of all time. It's such an amazing story. You'll be blown away with it. You don't have to be a child to read this. It's basically about him who comes to Earth and he's traveling around the universe, jumping from planet to planet, and his adventures on it. He ends up uh, coming into contact with a pilot who's in the middle of the desert. His plane ends up malfunctioning, has to land in the desert, and then he shows up, and you don't know whether the boy is like a, you know, a mirage or a figment of, of the uh, the dehydrated pilot's imagination or not. But they go on a, you know, a, a trip together in in storytelling as the little boy tells of his adventures, and and there's a lot of lessons to be learned in it and everything. Uh, Saint Uxbury, uh really really hit it on the head with this this book. If you have not read it. It's originally in French, but even the English translation is uh, really good as well. All right, next up is the Golden Library's uh, Great Novels of Thomas Hardy. This was a series, the Golden Library. I don't know how many volumes were in it, but I know the only one that I saw other than this one is the George Eliot one. This one has his three greatest novels in it, which are Tess of the Dubervilles and Far From the Maddening Crowd and The Mayor of Casterbridge. All right, I won't go into those books because I've done it in the past in past videos. All right. And then I found this really nice copy of Dr. Seuss's Oh, The Places You Will Go. All right. And it's a hardcover with a dust jacket. And these ones are more um, difficult to find. You usually get the smaller ones that are about this size, no ju dust jacket hardcovers, right? So um, this one's really nice. So I thought maybe this might sell pretty well. So I took a chance and picked it up. I, I did read this to my son when he was like three or four years old. So it, ha it does have a, a sentimental little tinge in, in the heart for Dr. Seuss, a lot of his stuff. I grew up with Dr. Seuss, reading Dr. Seuss when I first started to learn, and so did my son. And 
Uh, so uh, I don't know what the political correctness version of it, of it is today, whether you're supposed to read Kids, Dr. Seuss or not. Anyways, it's just a bunch of ridiculous. Uh, he's a great author, and it's great for kids to learn how to uh, read. All right. Next up is uh, Ethel Wilson's Teddy Dorval. Uh, this is part of the New Canadian Library, the latest before the New Canadian Library shut down and no longer um, is around. Uh, uh, the imprint is owned actually by, is it a Dutch? I think it's a Dutch um, a Dutch company that bought McClellan and Stewart. I would have to do the research again, but um, anyways. McClellan and Stewart, which is the quote-unquote Canadian publishers, and they're the ones that had the imprint of the new Canadian Library. You know, so they started putting the new Canadian Library books out back in the you know the 1950s and 60s, all the way up to today. Well, in like the mid 2000s or whatever, uh, they ended up getting bought out, and now you no longer um, have the imprint of McClellan and Stewart, or do you? Do they still put out M&S books, even though they're owned by a Dutch company? Um, anyways, but you don't see these books anymore. The New Canadian Library is defunct, all right? Um, you do see, um, you know, Penguin Modern Classic versions um, and, and some hardcover versions of, 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 of the, most, the more popular um, Canadian novels, you know, like uh, Apprenticeship of Duddy Kravitz has a Penguin uh, Modern classics edition of it uh, you know uh, Stephen Leacock has has a couple of books in that library as well so you still get Canadian literature but it's put out by foreign it's not put out by Canadians anymore it's put out by foreign foreign you know English or British or Dutch I think that du that Dutch company owns penguin as well um, owns so many different imprints it's a huge huge conglomerate of companies um, I just can't remember the name of it um, Anyway, so they own the New Canadian Library, and they don't put out New Canadian Library books anymore. This was the last version. This is the sixth different cover, and these are trade paperback size or soft paperback rather than the, you know, uh, paperback sizes that usually they came out. They came out with a, a good number of them in this um, trade paper size or soft cover size, right? And uh, <clears throat> they're all really nice editions, but it didn't save them from going out of business, I guess, right? So that's the Hedy Dorval from Ethel Wilson. Sun Also Rises by Ernest Hemingway in paperback form. I've spoken about this novel numerous times in previous videos, and so have I with this one, Catcher in the Rye, uh, one of the great teen angst books. All right, and then we have Howl. I spoke about Howl when I found a book of, of you know, uh, the selected poetry of Allen Ginsberg, and Howl was the main poem in that, the first poem in that, but this is actually how it first came out back in, what was it, the mid-50s, you know, during the Beat Generation times. How is uh, one of the greatest American poems of all time. You haven't writ read it, r read it. I mean, it was considered obscene at one time when it first came out for a lot of the graphic nature of, of, of the wording in it and, uh, you know, homosexuality and other stuff that's in that poem. Um, in fact, it was brought to court as an obscene thing, and uh, the company, what was the name of the company? Uh, City Lights was brought to court for, uh, you know, publishing obscenities, right? And the state lost, and uh, ended up continuing to be published, if you haven't read it. Take a gander at it. Another of the, uh, the newest versions of the, uh, of the, um, Oxford World Classics, and this is the trilogy of, of, uh, of Figaro, right? So we have The Barber of Seville, The Marriage of Figaro, and The Guilty Mother, basically three plays by Beauchemin, Beaumarchais, sorry, ignorant intellectual, about Figaro, all right? Um, I read the first one, which was uh, The Barber of Seville, which was pretty good, but I never ended up reading the next two. But these are like three classic plays in French literature, and if you take French literature, uh, don't be surprised if you end up having to read a book like this one, all right? And Jane Austen's Sense and Sensibility from the Penguin Classics, again, the one previous, uh, not the newest version of the Penguin Classics, and Sense and Sensibility I spoke about before as well. 
so I won't do that. All right, and we got Waiting for Godot by Samuel Beckett, another great, another great play. Basically about two guys by a tree waiting for Godot, and then you end up getting to a, a really interesting philosophical um, conversation, right? So it's, uh, it's quite a good play, and it's not long. Uh, you can read it in one sitting. And uh, it's kind of like a tragedy. It's kind of like a comedy. It's kind of a mix, mix of, of, of genres. Um, and Beck is just such a good writer, so you'll quite enjoy it. Although I read it twice because the first time I read it, I didn't get it. All right, so next up is uh, The Odyssey, Homer's famous, famous novel, right? Or, sorry, poem. It's a long poem, an epic poem. It's basically about Odysseus. Uh, I spoke previously about it, but it's basically about Odysseus after the Trojan War. Um, he leaves to go back. He's the king of, where is he a king of? I can't remember. Is it Attica? Anyways, wherever he's the king of, he ends up going back. And during the Trojan War, or, um, he ended up pissing off a god. And the god decided to make his life quite interesting as he traveled back to his wife. Um, wherever it is in Thrace, or I don't know where, wherever it is Thrace. Um, anyway, so um, along the way, he ends up getting, you know, sidetracked, shipwrecked, uh, shipwrecked on an island with a with a uh, with a temptress. He ends up having to fight a cyclops. Anyways, it took him it takes him twenty years to get back to his wife, and all the while in those twenty years, everybody thinks he's dead, and so suitors have come to. Uh, to remarry his wife, and his wife is totally dedicated to him and doesn't uh, doesn't want to marry anybody else. But they kind of force their hand, move in. You know, these suitors start uh, eating her out of house and home, and finally Odysseus finally returns after twenty years and takes care of business. Let's put it that way. All right, so it's one of the great ones. This one and the Iliad, which is about uh, the Trojan War itself, are the two books that when you talk about Western literature, you will read first because they were the first ones. They were the oldest. All right. Next up, we have uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula, one of the great vampire and classic horror uh, books. Um, this is part of the Arcturus collection that I always mention. See how nice these copies are? I mean, the newsprint or the print that they use for the, for the, uh, for the paper or whatever doesn't know the top quality, but neither neither of these ones, right? So they're all made, you know, they're mass mass paperbacks, right? Um, but they have a really good selection in the, in their in their library, and they're all really 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 um, priced well. I think they came out to compete with, let's say, Oxford or the Everyman Library, the Modern Library, or you know, the Penguins Classics, and they come in a, at a price point that's much lower. A lot of the times, not all the time, but well, you can usually find these anywhere between, you know, five and six and seven dollars each, right? New. So, um, so that's Dracula, one of the great horror films. What else do we have? All right, we have the um, the Communist Manifesto. All right, so if you're if you're gonna want to know about Marxism, you know, uh, socialism, communism, you know, Lenin read it and took over. Uh, Russia during, uh, after World War One, and then after World War Two, Mao did the same thing in in China, spread to Cuba, went to uh, Korea, went all over Asia. And the Americans were fighting it, and uh, uh, but it spread everywhere. And then you know uh, you had the Cold War, right? So, um, but it all came from these German guys, Engels and Marx, right? And it all started with this, the Communist Manifesto. All right, so. If you're going to read it, that's the first book you should probably pick up. After that, maybe uh, Das Kapital uh, by Marx. Um, I really enjoyed, even though it's so much hoop, hooky, but anyways, I really enjoyed uh, Engels, um, The Origin of the Family, Private Property, and the State, if I remember correctly. That book was really interesting. I got a really good overall concept of why Marx and Engels think the way they do when it comes to uh, uh, communism or socialism. The thing about it is, is that you know it's been debunked, right? Um, mostly, but you you still have um, like I've always personally, uh, capitalism is the way to go, not 
because it doesn't have its detriments. It does, but you that's where socialism comes in. If you're going to use socialism, then you should use it as a buffer to capitalism to, in my opinion anyways, to, you know, roughen out the, uh, the sharp edges of capitalism so you don't have like a boom and a bust economy all the time. Um, use socialism to help, you know, things like unemployment insurance, um, welfare, uh, workmen's compensation, these social programs that keep workers, uh, you know, socialized medicine to keep them healthy so that they continue working, you know, workmen's compensation when they get injured, um, all that kind of thing where uh, the private sector, um, well, really, they just gouge when you know, if you look at the different systems around around the world, it's hard not to think that um, whenever you privatize things that are monopolistic, uh, they they really really get out of hand when it uh, when it comes to uh, charges. You understand? So, without competition, uh, things that are private should be you know things that that people can compete in, but things that aren't that way shouldn't be private it should be public right they're in the public uh it should be in the public domain um, because it's um it keeps prices reasonable right um because the government will will be the one that sets the prices not you know the private sector <clears throat> i mean if you really need a doctor it's like milk all right milk everybody uses milk so milk is uh you don't really have a choice. You got to buy milk. Almost half the recipes that you're ever going to make for supper involve milk. Um, so milk is kind of like a staple food that you need to eat. All right. So um, it would be like one company, private company, has has the uh, has the corner on milk, and they can charge whatever they want, and you're going to pay it uh, because. You know, you can't do without milk, right? That's what medicine is. That's what um, that kind of thing is. At least, I don't know, people can argue against that, I guess. But but any any type of uh, structure, you know, like um, the internet or, you know, uh, the telephone, you know, electricity, all these things don't make sense to have like 16 different companies involved in it because what are you going to do? Have like 16 power lines going across your country? No, you're going to have one power line, right? You're not going to have like, uh, telephone cables of 18 different companies going across, no, you can have one, right? So so these are the things that need to be highly regulated, and otherwise, you know, they end up becoming monopolies and you end up paying through your teeth uh, for any of these services um, because they're needed and you have no choice and they can charge whatever the hell they want, right? So, so capitalism is great when there's competition, although capitalism is set up to eliminate competition and become monopolistic. So you need social uh, programs and social insight into it in order for you not to have like what's going on half the time with where you have uh, one corporation um, dominating the market, right? So you always want to at least have three or four or five or six in, 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 the, in the market to keep it competitive, right? So anyway, so enough of my thinking. The Communist Manifesto talks about how there is no private property. You end up, everything is socialized. Everything is is. Um, owned by everybody or the state, basically. And you have a basically a one-party system, but he speaks mostly on economics. And basically, he basically has this argument that says that capitalism takes advantage of the working class by uh, not paying them fully for their labor. In other words, let's say uh, labor is worth 100% of something, all right? Well, they, they'll pay the workers 50%, and that other 50% is, is what goes into the pocket of the capitalist or the, uh, you know, the, uh, the owner of the means of production, as, as he would say. Um, so the profit, that other 50% that he takes out, is robbing the, robbing the working class of their labor. They should be paid that 100%, which makes absolutely no sense to me. Um, and it shouldn't to you either, I don't think, because... I understand that somebody like Elon Musk is 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 making billions of dollars off of people who are working for him. All right, but most of the time, all right, if you start a business, where 
is your salary, right? So if you own a business, where's your salary? Your salary is the profit that you make. So after you pay your employees, after you pay your expenses, after you buy your product that you're going to resell, after all of that, if you brought in more money than you put out, that's your salary, right? You're the one that took the chance with the business, right? You're the one that started the business. You're the one that did the initial investment into the business, right? So where is your salary? Well, you're going to pay your employees, whether it's on salary or, or by the hour. That's their salaries. But where is your salary? Well, your salary is the profit that your business makes. So if Marx is correct in saying that if 50% is given to the worker for his work and the other 50% is stolen from him um, by the capitalist, uh, then if the worker gets 100% of the proceeds where, how does the business stay in business, right? It doesn't. That's why you see, um, that's why you saw the crash. You saw, um, there's a lot of reasons why people thought that, that um, you know, the Soviet Union failed, right? But you hardly hear, at least I don't, you know what I mean? Um, you hardly hear that it was in competition with, with the greatest capitalist country that's ever ever been produced, right? The United States. And the United States, the thing about capitalist countries is they don't have to take care of their poor, all right? You won't have a revolution if you don't take care of your poor, all right? The problem with uh, socialism is you need to take care of your poor because everybody's poor, right? You understand? Nobody's there to make an incentive to make a profit. Therefore, you know, salaries stagnate. You only You only get what you need, not what you want. All right, so your basics are provided, but you don't get much else, and you end up in in lines for like a two hours to get toilet paper. You know what I mean? Um, <clears throat> so uh, everybody ends up poor in in a, in a socialist cap, communist country, right? Um, so you end up having a revolution, or you end up having to change, right? Because you have to take care of your poor, and you have to pay everybody enough for them to live. Where in a capitalist country, you don't really need to, although. The more money the rich make, even though people don't like it, um, that filters down, and everybody, you know, it's that boat theory that they talk about, you know, raising high, higher on the boat, right? So, um, you do have winners and lose, losers in capitalism, and that's where those socialist programs come in to curb, you know, that, that jagged edge of capitalism, but there's nothing that can substitute from um, profit-seeking, from coming up with an idea that you think will make money and then going and, and doing it, that benefits you, but it also benefits everybody around you. Okay. So, um, so, and that incentive isn't there in a communist state, right? Where you don't even own any property, right? So, um, now you take China, China is a booming economy because what did they do? Well, they were a socialist state. Uh, they still are in a way, uh, and I think they're the first that I've ever seen um, that has mixed communism with capitalism rather than socialism, all right? So communism is a political entity. Socialism is the economic entity, right? So um, communism meshes with socialism, all right? Whereas in democracies mesh with capitalism. Because in democracies, you're free, so you're free to do as you choose. Capitalism is a free market type of society. Communism, everything is state-run, so socialism is a state-run type of economy, so they, they match. So what did China do? They were going to go bankrupt, right? They had a whole bunch of uh, farmers and peasants, and people were starving and all that. And what did they do? They just allowed uh, economic development inside the country, capitalistic style, right? But they just make sure that all the capitalists in the country are not political in, in nature. Don't try to screw around with the political system because if they do, they end up disappearing, right? So that's how strong the Communist Party is in China. It's been around for like 80 years. Everybody's used to it. And you don't have a revolution even though you have huge amounts of um, you know millionaires and billionaires in China now that are all capitalist communists. So it's, it's kind of like a strange... Uh, strange um, Strange bedfellows, let's put it that way. But that's the reason why China's successful. It's because of uh, you know allowing investment and capital to go into the country and develop, right? So, 
<clears throat> so it's not like they're successful because of communism and socialism. They're successful because of capitalism, right? So, all right, so let's move on. Anyways, so this is debunked in my opinion, but it's really good to learn it um, to get an idea of that whole thing starting from the early 1900s all the way up to, you know, post 20th, 21st century. Um, now the only communist countries left that are semi communist are, you know, Cuba, although I bet. They're moving away from it. Uh, China, with their capitalist economic system, and North Korea, and a couple other small places. Right? So, and look at North Korea, one of the poorest countries in the world. All right. So, um, next up after that is Mad Adam, a novel by Margaret Atwood. This one is the third in her uh, trilogy um, about a futuristic world that that was taken down by um, what was it? gene manipulation um, that kind of thing so um it's really good i read the first two when they came out and then then i moved on to other things and then this one came out and i haven't read it yet so i'm gonna read it um all right so that's matt adam by margaret atwood um uh, next up is international collector's library the once and future king by th white all right so there's there's a few uh books on king arthur right king arthur you know the whole english legend myth whatever you want to call it of king arthur right uh i'm going to show you another of of of, of that book in a, in a, a bit later on where is it somewhere here. Right, there it is so but it, um you know the myth of, of king arthur has been around for you know, millennia, right? So, um, this one here, the Once and Future King, and probably um, the Mists of Avalon. I don't know if you've read that one, but the Mists of Avalon is another really good story. That one is taken from Morgan Le Fay's point of view, the, the whole Arthurian legend story about King Arthur and Guinevere and Sir Lancelot and all those characters. One of them was Morgan Le Fay, you know, the evil witch or whatever, right? And the you know, with Merlin, Merlin's um, arch nemesis, I guess you could say. Well, uh, the Mists of Avalon takes it from the point of view of Morgan Le Fay and tells the whole story through her eyes, which was really interesting. It's a really enjoyable book if you like the King Arthur legend. But the ones that you're going to read are this one, all right, which is probably the, the latest one, the closest one to now. But you had a, I can't remember the guy's name, I'll put it here. Um, he ended up having a few stories, and then we had a comprehensive um, edition of uh, Thomas Mallory's Lamar, Darthur, The Death of Arthur, which takes all the stories, all the legends before it, and kind of composes them all into one big, uh, like, omnibus type of story, whatever. And here it is here. <clears throat> so Thomas Mallory's Lamar, Darthur. This is probably the most popular out of all the. Arthur legends and and what when people end up telling the 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 King Arthur uh, stories they usually refer back to Mallory's book on it to you know <clears throat> to retell the story right that's what he did all right so and this is an international collector's library which is quite popular a set of books they're like faux leather and they really look nice on a shelf if you have a whole bunch of them the problem is is they are made with inferior paper and you know made cheaply so over time they they get brittle and they break the paper dries out and it cracks and snaps right so it's very hard to find these books in really really good condition see already this one is already being bent and another thing they did which was really um, irritating is if you notice here see that in here so the, so if you notice the pages are indented more than the book, like like usual. Most 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 books are that way, where the the hardcover book, the actual cover is is bigger than the actual pages inside to protect the pages. The problem is, is that they made the the spine of it so thin that what happens over time is when you put these on the shelf, they push the bottom 
upwards and it cracks and it breaks, cracks and breaks as it dries. So it's extremely hard to keep these in really good condition, but people like to collect them. And uh, this King Arthur story called The Once and Future King is one of the more popular stories of King Arthur. and People buy it a lot, all right? So that's uh, that. All right, we have that one. Okay, now we have uh, The Rise and Fall. I just showed you this one in a previous video, and I found it again. I had already sold this book already. I'm going to sell this one. This is basically the, if you want to learn about um, the Nazis in World War II and how they came to power and what they did during the war and how they were defeated, Shire's book is the definitive book on that. And it's an extremely thick book, all right? Okay. Now, this is the paperback version. You have a hardcover version of it as well. And it's uh, actually a couple of volumes. Actually, no, it's one really thick volume. All right, so that's uh, Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. And we got La Marique en Francais um, by Kafka. Kafka is one of the greatest writers of all time. So anything that you come across by Kafka, pick up and read. You'll quite enjoy it. Um, he's uh, He'll open up your mind, let's put it that way. All right. And do I have any more books? Yes, I do. All right. But I have movies here, but I'm going to put those over here. And we'll do movies after. All right. So we have John Cheever's greatest novel, which is uh, Falconer. All right. I've reviewed this before in a previous uh, video, so I'm not going to do it again. But if you come across this book, pick it up and read it. Tell me what you think. All right. And then we have another Oxford um, World's Classic. And this one is uh, the Oxford Shakespeare. They have uh, all of his plays in this volume, and they all look like this, right? And this one is uh, The Winter's Tale, one of his lesser known uh, plays, all right? And then we have one of the great religion slash philosophy books of all time, and that's uh, William James' The Varieties of Religious Experience, A Study in Human Nature. So he takes philosophy, human nature, and religion and goes through it all. And it's an extremely interesting book if you have not read this book, all right? So I highly recommend this book. All right, I think this is all the books. Yes, all the books. Okay, so that's the books. Lots and lots of books. Uh, let's do the CDs. What did, I ended up going into a uh, thrift store. I guess somebody got rid of uh, some of their uh, Tom Waits. CDs because I found a bunch of them. Um, even more I didn't pick up because I already had had them, but um, I did pick up uh, some of them. All right, and uh, if you don't know who Tom Waits is, Tom Waits. I mean, he's acted, he's acting, but he's basically he's basically a poet that uh, puts his poetry to music, kind of like uh, Leonard Cohen and some others, right? So. Um, and he's got a really scruffy voice, and he sings scruffily on purpose. He could sing with a less scruffy voice, but, you know, he's known for that. You know, that's his signature, that scruffy voice, backed usually by jazz musicians. So it's kind of like a jazzy, smoky room kind of thing. You can picture yourself in a smoky room with him on a small stage with his uh, accompaniment, and, and you're listening, you know, getting drunk, uh, listening to his music and his uh, original voice. All right, so... So here we have uh, Mule var Variations, all right, that's one of his greats. We have Big Time, all right. We have Bone Machine, all right, and we have Beautiful Maladies, all right. So basically, there's two albums probably that people will most mention as his two greatest, and that one is, uh, you know, I can't remember. Um, Swordfish Trombone. I always confuse uh, the Tom Waits album with the Captain Beefheart album, Trout Master Repula. So Swordfish Trombones is one of them, and the other one is uh, the one where the, the two men are hugging on the cover. Uh, Rain Dogs. All right, so those two albums I've listened to numerous times, and they're extremely good. But anything by Tom Waits is good if, if you're like in a bohemian type of mood on it. Bohemian, or you know, like in an alternate type type of mood where you want to listen to slower music with a scratchy voice, and you know, uh, he he has a way with words that really captivate captivates you and kind of sucks you into the song, and you just listen and you're mesmerized. It's great just to sit down and listen to Tom Waits. 
um, without ha having to do anything else, right? Not so much to listen to him if you're in your car driving, all right? Because he's distracting when you, when you listen to him. So you don't want to listen to him maybe not in your car because, uh, you know, his turns of phrases and what he says kind of grabs your attention. You start listening to it and not paying as much attention to the road, right? So it's better to listen to him at home, okay? So that's Tom Waits. And I also found this, um, Neil Young, the American who was born in Canada, but most people claim him to be Canadian, but most of his life he's lived in the south um, of the United States on a ranch, right? Once he once he became rich, you know, and he became popular with, uh, you know, Crosby, Stills, and Ash and Young, you know, that type of thing. Anyway, so if you want, if you'd rather not go around trying to get all the, you know, Harvest, Harvest Moon, um, all his great albums you want to just get you know his greatest hits well this is probably where you want to go and that's uh originally this came out on three lps it was a compilation lp a record with three records in it um, but they combined it into two cds so you get all the cds but it, it's all the hits from you know the 60s and 70s right uh, sugar mountain the loner Cinnamon Girl, Down by the River, A Man Needs a Maid, oh, really? Like a Hurricane. Anyways, it's all of his stuff from the 60s and 70s. Um, so if you want to listen to uh, just one album by him, that's probably the one that you should listen to, although I'm not a huge fan of compilation this. All right. Uh, so that's the... All right, so let's do movies. What should we do first? All right, so I don't know if I should. <clears throat> so there was a guy that had a bunch of um, online on, on, on Facebook Marketplace, had had a like a group of uh, documentary Blu-rays that he was selling um, and some other stuff that he was selling as well, like Blu-rays. So I picked up a bunch of stuff, and when I went over to his place, um, he said he has a bunch of uh, DVD documentaries that, like, I asked for a discount from him um, because I was buying a bunch of things from him. So I, I, I said, would you take this amount for the stuff that I wanted to buy? <clears throat> he said, sure, but when it went over, he said he had a bunch of documentaries, and I really like documentaries, right? So... I don't know how many, 150 of them, something like that. Anyways, um, he said he would give them to me if I paid full price for the other stuff that I was going to buy. He would just give them to me because he's getting rid of a lot of his library because he's making space. Um, and so he's curating his library to shrink it down to like maybe one-tenth the size of what it is. So he's getting rid of a lot of stuff. But he's worried, you know, because if you're a collector and, and you like, things that you collect when you end up, if you're still alive and you don't die and just pass them on to your children or whatever, um, and you want to get rid of them because you need space, you don't want, you know, I mean, if you just didn't care about them, you just bring them to, uh, you know, Salvation Army or whatever, and, and they can go in the garbage if nobody picks them up or whatever, right? But if, you know, if you've spent a lot of time and money on, on, on your collection and now you're, you're kind of getting rid of it, um, you want it to go into the hands of somebody that will, you know, care for it really the way that you do right so you want a movie lover to get so he knew that because i bought stuff off of him previously so when i made an offer on the other stuff he accepted it but then he said he'd give it if i paid full price for the other stuff which was only another you know 20 30 dollars or whatever right so um i said sure so i ended up getting i don't know how many documentaries but i thought i'd show them to you now It ended up coming in three binders because what he did was he took them all out of their cases, kept the sleeves, and kept the disc, and put them in these um, portable cases that you can carry around with you, right? And they fit, I don't know, about 60 to 100 uh, discs, right? So he had three of those, right? Three of those just full of movies. Um, and so he just gave them all to me. So uh, I started putting them back into 
into DVD cases. And anyway, so I thought I'd show you. Okay, so we got Simply Raw reversing diabetes in 30 days. All right, I'm not gonna. I'm just gonna show you all these documentaries that are out there. Forks over knives. This guy was really, really big into watching documentaries on food and food security and stuff. So fork over knives. All right. We have Monsanto. You know, Monsanto got such a bad reputation. These guys. They <clears throat> they genetically modify corn to make it more resilient in different weather. All right. Um, but they patent it. All right. So if you buy, let's say, a seed seeds off of them, what happens is they give you a a contract that you can only use the seeds for that day, uh, that year, or whatever, right? And you can't use them again. You have to buy the next year. You have to buy seeds off them again, right? Now, if you know anything about farming, farm farmers keep their seeds, right? So what they'll do is they'll they'll plant a a crop, all right, with the seeds, and then when the crop grows, they'll take seeds from the crop that has grown and preserve them for the next year's crop right you understand so um so they always have seeds for the next year's crop and they protect those seeds and you have a bunch of different varieties of these different seeds and what happened is monsanto ends up taking over so much and then you end up having to rebuy monsanto seeds every year which costs the farmer so much more but you know a lot of farms are now corporate right so, um and uh uh, the seeds, the variety of seeds has shrunk because of it, right? And, you know, they, there's been cases where they've they've gone after farmers for using the seeds more than one year, um, that kind of thing. Anyways, they're... So, from dioxin to genetically modified crops, the world according to Monsanto. So, it's probably a skating of what I was talking about. Hungry for change, your health in your hands. All right. Um, King Corn, you are what you eat. All right. Water on the table, which is basically, uh, he has a bunch of documentaries on water as well. But, you know, as the population increases, world population, you end up having uh, less and less water. And what's going to happen with that? A fierce green fire, um, our daily bread. And where does the food come from? A place at the table. American meat. GMO, OMG. That's a really cool title for, for a movie. All right. Slow food story. All right. Farmland. The perfect human diet. Genetic roulette. All right, it's all about food security, water, food, that kind of thing. And it continues. Generation RX. Good food, bad food. All right, so now we're going into power or electricity, that kind of thing. Breaking free, all right. The shale rock revolution, all right. Nuclear nation, more food, more than honey. Chasing ice, on climate change, wasteland. The story of oil, food matters. Food beware. Fat, sick, and nearly dead. Food ink. The green chain. The unforeseen. Fresh. Farmageddon. And then I have a whole box there. So those are some examples of, of what he has. And he ends up uh, going into food and water, um, climate change, 
war and history, especially history of war. Um, those are the subjects that he really, really liked, it seemed, because those are what all the uh, documentaries are about. So you'll end up getting to see these documentaries. What I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be watching them all. And as I watch them, I'm going to bring them and, you know, let you know what they are about, right? So, uh, so I just thought I'd give you a, a sample of what I ended up getting for s such a reasonable price. Oh, and then there's this one. I ran out of, I ran out of extra cases, DVD cases, and here's another one. Water Wars. All right, so I just have the, so what he did was he, he would put the disc into this portable carrying case and he would put the, the, uh, a sleeve in it as well. So I'm just re putting them back into uh, the kind of ran out of <laughs> I'll have to go find. Actually, he has some. Um, if, if he ends up putting anything else up on Kijiji or Facebook Marketplace that I want to buy, then I'll go get another box because I took one box of empty DVD cases from him. I thought it would be enough, but it wasn't. All right, so, um, all right. So now we'll go through stuff that I have watched from stuff that I picked up previously. The Rush Hour Trilogy. I bought this new one on Amazon. They were having a, uh, whatchamacallit, Black Friday sale on it. So I got it for a really, really cheap price. And I like the Rush Hour films, um, you know, because I like Jackie Chan's uh, stuff, especially his comedic martial arts stuff. is kind of funny. And, you know, Chris Tucker is a bit over the top in these films, but he's fun as well. And the action's fun. Storyline's pretty good. Um, so if you haven't, You've got to watch the Rush Hour. Anyways, this is a three-disc Blu-ray of all three of the trilogies all in one case, which I love because it saves space on, on, on the shelves, right? Um, <clears throat> Jackie Chan is one of the, you know, the great martial arts co comedic filmmakers, right? So, And then, from another guy that I buy stuff off of um, quite frequently, I found, I, I got three Criterions off of him. All right, and the first one was La Jetée. All right, so this is number 387 in the collection, Blu-ray. They're all Blu-rays, all right. One of the most influential radical science fiction films ever made and a mind-bending free-form travelogue. All right, so science fiction film, La Jetée. Um, and I also got George Washington off of him. Over the course of one hot summer, a group of children in the decaying rural South must confront a tangle of difficult choices. An ambitiously constructed, elegantly photographed meditation on adolescence. All right. George Washington and Until the End of the World. All right. So George Washington is numbered uh, 152 in the collection. And then we have The End of the World, Until the End of the World, which is number 1007. And uh, this one is conceived as the ultimate road movie. This decades in the making science fiction epic from Wim Wenders follows the restless Claire Tournor across continent as across continents as she pursues a mysterious stranger in possession of a device that can make the blind see and bring dream images to waking life. Sounds quite interesting. All right, so those three criterions I will add to my collection. I also found three uh, DVDs at thrift stores. I found they were expendable. All right, this is a John Ford film. John Ford. And I collect John Ford films. He's one of the great Western war uh, guys from the you know the 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s, that, that period of time in, in, in American cinema. And all of his films are, are, are pretty good. All right, so I picked that up. And you're not going to find a lot of these ones on Blu-ray, right? Um, unless you really search for them or, you know, maybe Kino Rover gets, uh, gets a copy of them or something like that. But usually the older ones, um, maybe Criterion, you may find one in a Criterion. But it's hard to find these on 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 Blu-ray if they actually exist. So whenever I find an older film on DVD, I don't mind picking it up. Some people just don't like buying DVDs because they're on to the, uh, you know, the Blu-ray or 4K um, level, all right? But then they end up missing out on films like this one, right? So uh, then I found this uh, Turner Classic Movies, the TCM 
collection, you know, where they have four movies in one one in one package. All right, and this one is the romance package, which is Splendor in the Grass, Love in the Afternoon, Mogambo, and now Voyager. All right. So, Mungambo, this one, is directed by John Ford, all right? And Billy Wilder directs Love in the Afternoon. So, Billy Wilder is another great director. Um, and Kazan, I think, directs Splendor in the Grass, doesn't it? Kazan directs that one? Yeah, Splendor in the Grass is Elia Kazan, all right? And fourth one, might as well mention it. Now Voyager is directed by Max Steiner. All right, all, all great uh, directors from early cinema. All right. Um, okay, so now we did those ones. ones. We got Tron Legacy. All right, so Tron Legacy. This is the sequel to the, you know, the Disney film uh, Tron back in the 80s. Um, <clears throat> it jumps like 30 years into the future, and uh, what's-his-name ends up going back in, right? So um, the storyline is pretty vague, you know what I mean? It's not a great story, um, but the visuals in this are extremely good, all right? So I went and saw this at the theater, and... You know, the visual experience of, of the film really blew me away, but the storyline was kind of lame, actually. So, But I didn't have it. So uh, Then we have Ford versus Ferrari. This was a really good film. Who directed this? James Mangold. Um, I showed you a DVD earlier that I watched, and I did a review of the, of the film, a quick review of it. So I didn't have it on Blu-ray yet, and now I found it on Blu-ray, so I can combine the two, save some uh, shelf space. It's basically about... How Ford was waning uh, in sales, and they thought up of an idea of, of taking on Ferrari in you know racing, and they started to make uh, they hired uh, some guys to uh, create a really fast um, race car in order to get their name out there and increase sales, and it worked. All right. Next up after that is in the name of the Father. Um, before what was the name of that film? There Will Be Blood, and Gangs of New York. This was the film that everybody turned to in Lost, Lost, Last of the Mohicans, but I think this one is probably, uh, what's his name, it's the best film, Daniel Day-Lewis's best film until he ended up doing those later films. Um, <clears throat> uh, I watched this, but it's been like 30, 40 years since I've watched it, so I can't remember what it's about, so I'll watch it again, and I'll do a review on it. And then I found this one, which is really cool. Really nice, beautiful steelbook of all the Jurassic Park films. All right, it's called uh, Jurassic World Collection. It has all five films inside. The problem is, is that they don't have you know individual uh, clamshells for each. They kind of stack them in, onto two, right? So hopefully it doesn't scratch the films too much. All right. So I found that. So I can get rid of all the individual Blu-rays that I have of it and have just one which shrinks the space that I need, right? You've watched a lot of the Jurassic. It's all, you know, dinosaurs. They end up getting a... You know, they mix it with a mosquito or something, DNA, and create dinosaurs, and all hell breaks loose when they break free of their cages, right? So every movie is pretty much the same in that way. Just another film about dinosaurs, and then the dinosaurs get out and start killing people. That's basically the premise for all five of the films, right? So, But they're fun. They're fun to watch. So Spielberg directed the first one. I don't know if he directed any of the other ones, but he directed the first one, which was really good. All right, so a nice steelbook of uh, Jurassic World. I should actually... I'll show you what I do with them. All right. All right, so what I do... Yes, okay, so what I do first is with every, every um, DVD, Blu-ray, 4K, or anything that is uh, <clears throat> is in a steelbook, I need to protect it. Also, any um, 
DVD or Blu-ray or, or 4K that's in a, um, like the one that I, sh the one that I showed you, uh, of Rush Hour. It has like three discs inside. Um, so if I was to, uh, okay, let's start this again. Okay, so the best way to protect your media is, is with plastic bags, all right? You want to protect them because the reason why you want to protect them is, let's say, well, if you have a regular Blu-ray or a regular uh, um, DVD case, they're very easy to replace. You can buy them cheap for under a dollar each, so it's not a big deal for those ones. Those ones can go on the, on the shelves naked, I guess you could say, right? Um, but the ones that are difficult to find, all right, is like, here's a Blu-ray case that's white, all right? It's not, you know, it's not, um, it's not black, all right? It's not a black Blu-ray case. It's a white Blu-ray case, and it has a way of stacking two discs on it, all right? And it's thicker than the usual Blu-ray case, all right? So this, these are expensive to replace, uh, the cases themselves. You might be able to buy, if you can find them. Um, they're going to cost you like $5 each. So it's not inexpensive to replace those. So why you end up re replacing them is maybe you drop it and it cracks or, or you open it too many times and it snaps or something. But no, mostly the reason why you're going to replace them is because of discoloring. If you're a smoker, especially all your, all your plastic and all your movies is going to discolor over time, right? <clears throat> or the, you know, the plastic that holds in the sleeve yellows over time right that also so it makes it look ugly over time so you want to preserve things because you're going to keep them for the rest of your life usually if you're a collector anyways and you like movies or this movie is something that you're going to watch re-watch all the time right you want to protect them so that they stay looking new all right another reason why you want to do that is because you may want to resell it later and if the newer it looks the easier it is to resell and the more you can uh, charge uh, when you do resell it right so but the main thing is so that you don't have to buy another um, case in order to put the movie in, right? Because the case ends up deteriorating over time. So, um, my son. So, uh, so that's the reason why the easy ones to replace the regular blue Blu-rays, the black DVD cases, easy to replace. You don't have to protect them, spend the extra money. These bags cost about you know two cents each or something like that. You can buy. 100 bags for like 20 bucks so maybe five cents each so uh so you don't want to spend that extra money on something that's very easily replaceable right um, but the ones that you can't replace let's say the ones that are made of paper you know you, you'll have films put in ones that have ones that have sleeves you know the ones that uh are made of paper rather than plastic you know the digi cases that kind of thing you want to protect these because well, the digit one, you can't replace the digit one. Once it gets destroyed, it's toast, right? You, you can't replace it. You can't buy it used. Like, you can buy these white see-through cases um, used, but you're going to pay through the teeth for them, right? So you want to protect them from going yellow or getting damaged when they're on the shelf and all that, right? Anything with paper, you want to protect it as well, right? Um, so that's the reason why you protect. Now, I see people who collect movies... And none of them are protecting their media. It's like the r most ridiculous thing I've seen in my life. Maybe they can explain it to you. If they end up happening to come and buy one of my videos, maybe they can explain in the bottom why they don't do it. I know some people don't do it because, you know, they're on a budget. And rather spend $20 on 100 of these, they could buy a movie instead, right? Or maybe they don't care what the condition of the movie is. They just care that they have the movie and, and are able to watch it, right? But the thing is, you're more of a custodian of your films uh, rather than an owner, because what's going to happen is eventually they're going to go into somebody else's hands because you die or you get sick of collecting or maybe you don't want to do movies anymore. Maybe you want to move on to some other media. So you start selling everything off, right? So, um, so it's good to protect your media. So especially now with these steel books, the thing about these steel books are, is they scratch very, very easily, super easily. In fact, I would make a bet like a hundred percent bet that if you take this and put it on the shelf just like this without protecting it in any way all of your steel books are going to be scratched over time they're going to have a dent in them they're going to have a scratch in them right they're going to look ugly over time because you're moving them around you're pulling them out to watch them you're putting them back in you're moving stuff around as you get 
other stuff, right? You know, you're putting everything in alphabetical order, so maybe it's here, but then you get some other movies that are here, so you got to push this over to fit those movies there, so you're pushing it back and forth, taking it out, everything, and it ends up getting scratched, ends up looking like crap, right? And all you have to do is take a five-cent piece of plastic to put it around to protect it, right? Um, so I don't know why people don't do it. So what I do, though, is the first thing I do is protect it in plastic so that when I do use it, all right, um, it's protected when I take it on and off the shelf, right? So the first thing I do is I put it in a plastic bag, all right? Get the air out of it, all right? All right, so there you go. So now it's in a plastic bag. But the problem with that you don't get with this as you do with this is that if you drop this, it usually nothing happens. All right, and if it does, you can just replace the, you know, the uh, DVD case with this. If you drop it, it dents. Right, it usually dents, breaks, or cracks or scratches some corner wherever it hits. Right, and you know things fall. Right, you can't really help it. So what I do is I also get a plastic. One of these plastic um, protectors, right? So these things are great because they give you your your uh, Blu-ray case a skin to them, so that they're really not damaged, right? So what you do is you just—I don't know if you can see this, but I'll pop it in first. All right. With the with the steel books, all right, you're paying a premium for the steel books, right? So if you were to buy a regular movie on Blu-ray, let's say off of Amazon, maybe you're paying eleven ninety nine, fifteen ninety nine, up to like sometimes they're thirty bucks or whatever, right? But if they're more of a mainstream film, you're probably getting them for eleven to fifteen ninety nine each. But if you were to get the steel book, it's usually double that price. 25 30 35 dollars for a steelbook of that same movie right so you're paying a premium to get the steelbook yet you're putting it naked on the shelf to get it destroyed right all right so basically there it is all right now sorry upside down uh now there is a bit of a sacrifice for it in that it has plastic around it so it's not as easily visible all right so it's not as clean and, and and, you know, a lot of people like the aesthetic of having a whole bunch of steelbooks beside each other all on a, on a shelf because they're all uniform looking. The fronts of them are all uniform looking, right? And it looks does look really nice, right? It looks like a, you know, an encyclopedia library, you know what I mean, where every book looks exactly the same as the other one with just different, you know, designs on the front of it. But the aesthetic is still the same. They look really nice, right? So, like, uh, um books are the same way right so so it's less it's less visible because you have plastic over it so it it dims it a bit right so you can't see it as well but you still can see it and the the thing is protected right so all right so that's the jurassic films all right I just don't have a lot of space on my desk all right uh so next up that i bought was ant-man and the wasp this is the second ant-man film i have the first one but i didn't have the second one so i found it and it still had its nice sleeve slip cover to it so i will put this in a plastic bag as well because of the slip cover is made of um, paper and it'll brown and it'll dry out over time and it'll look like crap and you'll end up having to throw it away and whenever you have a slip cover on a on a movie it's easier to sell if you end up selling it right, All right so oh and ant-man and wasp not a bad movie one of the marvel films right? then i found this at a local record slash music slash movie store um the el duque tapes and this is a regretful purchase i saw that 
it was it was a reasonable price and Amazon uh, sorry Amazon and Arrow put it out usually Arrow films are pretty good um, it has the nice the nice booklet right with it okay so um so I thought I I thought I'd give it a look now that's El Duque there now he's a guy in Los Angeles who had like a heavy metal slash punk type of band that never went anywhere really big or anything. Um, <clears throat> uh, and, you know, he was on Jerry Springer or Maury Povich or one of those, you know, shock jock films that, uh, you know, like daytime TV shows that you got, Raldo Rivera, those type of shows back in the uh, 80s and 90s. Um, anyways, he, he, he grabbed a bit of fame, but, um, what happened was he had a friend of his that, that ended up going around with a camcorder and recording a whole bunch of stuff that he did. And all the stuff he was doing was pretty outrageous. And he, he defines his music as rape rock, right? So, uh, going into it, I didn't know that. I, re- I kind of read the back of it and it said, uh, I didn't understand exactly what, um, it was all about, right? So, and, Anyways, I watched, you know, about half of it, and then I stopped. And I was like, okay, it's just stupidity. I don't even know why Arrow would make a movie of it. But anyways, I'll probably resell this. The El, du- du- El Duce tapes, basically. All right. I have uh, <clears throat> things change. All right, so this is a film directed by David Mamet. And David Mamet, I collect. So when I found this film, I said, okay, I'm going to pick it up. And I watched it. And it's basically about um, Don Amenche and Joe Mag- Mantegna. All right. Anyways, it's about the, the Italian mob. He's like an underling in the Italian mob, and he's in the doghouse with the mob. So they end up assigning him to th- protect this guy. And this guy is a shoemaker, a shoe. He shines your shoes and uh, repairs your shoes, right? And basically, he looks a lot like a guy that ended up committing a a, a murder or a manslaughter or whatever, and it's going to go to jail. And he's part of the mob. So what they want to do is pay this guy a whole bunch of money so that he can buy a boat that he that he's always wanted. And what he'll do is he'll do the time for the other guy that looks really like him, right? So they'll kind of substitute him for the other guy. And if he agrees to do it, then He'll get a bunch of money and he can buy his boat. Then he will always wanted to buy a boat or whatever, right? So he, he agrees to do it. And then them two get together. And what happens is he's going to go into jail for three to five years. And what he does is he takes him to, um, not Las Vegas, but uh, was it Reno? Um, for like a, a weekend or whatever before he ends up going in. Now he's not supposed to do it. And they get into some interesting situations. Anyways, it's it's not a bad film. It's kind of blackluster and it's you know it's not the godfather let's put it that way um it's not a you know uh, the usual suspects or but it wasn't a bad film all right next up we have jane fonda's barbarella all right so barbarella is like this classic 60s kind of like a psychedelic film it's got like psychedelic rock music in it and it's, you know it's kind of like that new age kind of hippie shit right where uh, basically it's a uh, it's a catalyst for showing um jane fonda naked right yeah. um she was uh, you know one of the big heart throbs back in the 70s right 60s and 70s uh, jane fonda was in the 80s she turned to work at videos but back during her film career she was like a sex bot like, uh, you know, like Bridget Bardot and those kind of type of people. And this was a vehicle for putting her on film, right? And it's, you know, it's low, it's cheesy. It's uh, it's like a surreal type of film, let's put it that way. But it, it's a classic cult film, so I picked it up. I had it on uh, DVD, but I didn't have it on Blu-ray, so I found it on Blu-ray, so I picked it up. It's not a bad film. It's not great, all right? Here's a Jeanette McDonald and Ned Neil Eddy archive, uh, Warner Brothers archive film called Naughty Marietta. Now them two, them two, um, have been in a bunch of films. 
and they're kind of like opera opera singers, right? And they ended up going into films and doing a bunch of films, like ten or twelve of them together. And uh, this this is the second one I've watched of of them together. And this one is about uh, uh, there's a whole bunch of people in New Orleans, you know, uh, ex French ex Frenchmen that that travel to the New World to New Orleans, and they're all there doing work for you know uh, for France. And living there, but they have no wives. So what happens is, uh, France is going to send them over a whole bunch of people that uh, girls who agree that they want a new life or whatever, and get out of Paris or wherever, and go to the New World. And so they all put them on a the boat. Now she's a princess. Um, Jeanette McDonald plays a princess, um, and she's being forced by her father to marry some duke that she doesn't love, and she doesn't want to do it, right? So, so she ends up. Uh, Switching identities with another girl who was her like handmaid or whatever, and gets on this boat and travels to the New World and ends up meeting Nelson Eddy, who's a you know who's a like a like a hunter trapper type of guy um, in the in the military, protecting the colony against Indians and stuff like that. So uh, <clears throat> so they end up having a spark together, and there's music and there's singing in, in between. And it's I quite enjoyed the film. Um, them two have 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 kind of a, a spark on film together. So whenever I find any, so I've got two of them so far. So I'm gonna look for the other ten or you know eight or ten of the other films that they're in together. And his voice is very good. It's operatic level vocals, and so is hers, right? Um, but the stories are actually interesting enough, you know, the kind of romance stories are interesting enough that you follow them and you don't get bored, right? So, all right, so next up we have Rain Man. Barry Levinson directed this. I think Barry Levinson directed this. Um, basically, it's about Tom Cruise. He has an older brother who's autistic, like high on the spectrum of autism, if I remember correctly. This is the 25th anniversary edition of, of the film on Blu-ray. I have it on DVD, but I didn't have it on Blu-ray, so I picked it up. And basically, you know, it's a kind of a heartwarming film. He's he's uh, he uses his brother to count numbers to, to get money and everything. But anyways, there's a there's a twist in the film that makes it really uh, sweet, and is what grabs people's attention when it comes to this film. So if you haven't watched it, I would tell you not to. All right, then we have a new copy of The Magnificent Seven. Of which I have a DVD, but not the Blu-ray. Um, Yul Brenner is really good in this. And it's basically about, you know, it's like a remake of the uh, Seven Samurai films by Kira Kurosawa, where seven guys go into a town and protect it against a bunch of bandits. Right? Um, quite a good film. All right. Then we have um, Studio Canal Collection of Contempt with Brigitte Bardot. I have not watched this film, so this is one of the films that I'm going to be adding to watch. But it's uh, supposed to be a pretty good film, and uh, I'll let you know. I'll do a review of it in, in, in a future uh, in a future video, right? Uh, same with I Weiwei, Never Sorry. I have not seen this film either. I will watch it and let you know what it's about. And now here are the. Uh, remember, I was just talking about a guy with uh, all the different uh, Blu-rays uh, documentaries. Um, with all these DVDs, well, he had a bunch of Blu-rays, which were the ones I was buying in the first place, and here they are. So we have Fed Up. It's time to get real about food, all right? We have Freakonomics, all right? We have Fuel, Change Your Fuel, Change the World, all right? We have Eagle Hunter. Now, this one... Was supposed to be an extremely good film. This is one of the reasons why it grabbed my eye when I saw the picture in, in Facebook Marketplace. Was this film? All right. The greatest movie ever sold. All right. Like I said, he enjoyed uh, war war documentaries. Here's one here: Vietnam in HD. All right. And then I found The Magnificent Seven from him as well, and The Great Escape. Steve McQueen film. I have it on DVD, but not on Blu-ray. It's still a new copy. It wasn't even open. Right. Um, and Gone with the Wind. Also new. Not open. All right. Waiting for Superman. All 
Six Degrees, National Geographic film, another racing extinction. The Lemures of Madagascar. Samsara. All these films I have to watch, right? So, Ocean Oasis. So he's a bit of an environmentalist. Those are all the documentaries and new films I got off of him. All right. He was curtailing his film library. I also got Tie Me Up, Tie Me Down, the Criterion Collection film on Blu-ray. This is number 722 in the collection. All right. I have not watched it. And we got Fahrenheit 9-11, Michael Moore, great... Uh, leftist documentary guy and watermark another documentary and i am curious all right so this is number 179 in the collection so let's talk about this one for for a second all right so it's it's two films Two films by uh, what was what was the guy's name? Yeah, Vil Vilgot Jomman, S J O M A N. All right, he looks Swedish or Norwegian. Jomman. All right, all right. So one is I am curious blue and I am curious yellow. All right. So this is a box set of his two films, and the box has a number. It's number one seventy nine, and then the two films have a number, which is one eighty one and one eighty. So you have one seventy nine, one eighty, one eighty one. So if you're a, you're a guy that is collecting the Criterion Collection, and you like to see the numbers that are on the shelf for all the films, and you look through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, you know, all the way down, right? This is gonna irritate you, all right. And the reason why it's gonna irritate you is because you have to make a choice of either putting it this way to show these two numbers or putting it this way to show this number, all right? Um, Criterion has put out uh, films in box sets that the box doesn't have the number only the films have the number so it makes it easier for you you can just put it out like this right but when they number the box as well all right which isn't a film all right so when you look at criterion and you look at all the all the films let's say they're up to 1180 you think there's 1180 films in the collection but there isn't right you don't know the exact number because a few reasons. Number one is because of box sets like this, where you get a number that doesn't actually have a film attached to it. Or sometimes you'll get a get a film that has one film in it, but then it has a, a, a minor film by the same director, or a couple of his films, or some short films they add to it, which is cool. But uh, then you don't count th that film in, in your count either, right? <clears throat> so, um, so you don't know exactly how many unless you go through in detail how many films Criterion has actually put out, right? So, uh, But they will have box sets that don't have a number on it and have numbers here, and sometimes they'll have box sets that the box actually has a number. So I don't know why they do that. The only thing that I can think of is they're a business, so what's think like a businessman. Why would they do it? Um, well, they're making you do one of two things. If you want the box set whole, then you're going to put it in like this. Then you're going to buy another copy of it and put it in like that. So you're going to have two copies of it. So you're going to spend twice the amount of money. But any businessman knows that that would piss off your customer. And anytime you piss off your customer, what happens is if you piss them off too much, too many times, they just stop doing business with you, right? So it's not a good way of thinking. So I'm not sure why they number some of the box sets all right what a lot of people will do is take these out all right and what they'll do is they'll put this empty out of it and then they'll put this beside it so that they have all the numbers right so they have the numbers all directly but what happens with this box is it gets bent and, and damaged over time if you do that uh, without protecting it and how you protect it is you, you would need to t get two empty dvd cases and put those dvd cases in it and then put it in plastic and then put it up like that, and then you put it up like that, and then you have all the numbers. But now, you know, you're taking up space for two movies on your shelves, and, you know, shelves are limited space. 
So that would be irritating as well. The best thing to do if you're going to make a box set is just have the numbers on the on the movies themselves and not number the box. Now, they have done that in the past, but they've also done... Now, you can tell that this one was put out as a, as a set originally, all right? Because that number and that number and that number are all sequential. What they do sometimes, though, is they'll do gift sets, all right, where they'll put out, let's say, a group of uh, directors' movies in, in a box set that is independent of them in the library. So let's say maybe they'll do a... Uh, like a uh, <clears throat> Igmar Ber Bergman set, right? Which will have like six of his movies in this box set and all six of them will be numbered, but they're not in sequential order because what they did was they put them out individually over the years um, in, the, in the Criterion collection. They put them out and they had different numbers, right? So maybe they put out this one, it was number six, and then another one. Next time they put out another uh, Bergman film, it was number 14. Then next one they did was number 28. You know what I mean? But then they take the box set, right? And they put the films of Igmar Bergman in one box set. All right? That would be okay if they, because all these numbers aren't going to be sequential because they put the box set together after they published them in the, in, in the Criterion Collection, right? This one, they didn't. How you end up getting th these films are you buy this box set, you don't buy these individually. Although you could buy them individually, at least they're all numbered. If you buy them individually, then you will never have 179 in your collection. So let's say they put them out individually. You buy 170, uh, 180, and 181. And then you go, hey, where's 179? And you look through the collection. There's no 179 as a film because it's actually a box that put these two films. So you actually have to buy the box set in order to get that number. If you buy these two individually, you won't get that number, which is another irritant, right? Um, <clears throat> but then they'll put out a box set compilation of a bunch of films by a director. The box will have a number to it, but all the films will have the numbers of the original um, where they were put in the library. So what do you do with that? Do you put it at, let's say the number is 850, and then you look at the numbers of the six films, 14, 26, 84, 182, 642, you know. Um, they're not going to be in order, right? So that will irritate you as well. So what people will do will pull those out and put them individually in the number where they want to put them, and then they have this empty box set that they put, you know, again they'll put it in empty DVDs and then turn it around and have that number on it. So um, it's kind of irritating because sometimes what they'll do as well is they'll come out with a box set after after they put out let's say three films or four films of, of a director. And then they'll come out with a box set of that director and add two more films or one more film to it. And they'll put out the box set with the original ones that were already in the Criterion Collection and then the next film, right? But the only way you can buy it, you can't buy that film individually. You have to buy it in the box set. So they're making you buy three or four other films that you already have in your collection in order to get the box set. And maybe they number the box as well, right? So, so <clears throat> if you actually want to get every number in the Criterion Collection for your collection, you will be buying stuff or pulling stuff apart, you know, um, and spending more money than you really need to if they actually, you know, decided to have a brainstorming session and say, we're not going to come out with a Bergman set that has a whole bunch of different numbers to it and then number the box, right? I don't know if they've done that, but, you know, they have done that with, with some directors, right? So, so this one, you need to get it in the box set, otherwise you don't have the 179, right? And if you want to show the 179, now they're going to have to buy two of them, or you're going to have to pull these two out, put them on the shelf like this, turn this one around, and put the shelf, put that on the shelf as well, and protect the box so it doesn't get wrecked. Put two empty DVD cases inside to keep it square, right? So um, it's irritating what they do sometimes. Criterion Collection. All right, so. I haven't watched these films, so I, I'll review them at a later date. All right, so that's that. And I think that's everything. It is. All right, so um, there you go. So that's uh, what I've got over the last week or two. Um, and uh, give a great day. If you liked it, 
leave me a thumbs up. Thanks for subscribing. Um, I always come out with these videos every week or two. Um, and some other videos of my collection and other random videos. Um, they're quite enjoyable. And uh, I hope you liked it. And uh, you have a great day. And I'll talk to you in my next video. Bye for now.